So dear brothers and sisters, this gospel today uh, from John chapter 6 is the definitive gospel on the Holy Eucharist. It is crystal clear what the Lord is saying here. Now, we, as we say that, we admit immediately that for those hearing this gospel at the time, this gospel must have been absolutely shocking and and kind of incomprehensible. Like, what on earth do you do you mean? You keep talking about eating your flesh and drinking your blood. I mean, obviously you mean this poetically or symbolically or metaphorically because, I mean, we don't eat people. Like, it's, it's it, uh, it just, I mean, Jesus, I really like you. I do. But what's this eating you business about? Like, we, that's just not right, man. We can't do that. You know, I mean, so I, I, I can understand how those listening to him might have been just completely perplexed because they saw Jesus work miracles. They saw his preaching and teaching. And so far, I mean, the, the miracles are great. I love seeing people who can't uh, see or can't walk suddenly be healed and regain their strength and the rigidity in their limbs and fantastic. Oh, great. I'm all on for that. Eat my flesh and drink my blood. Say what? <laughs> what exactly? What exactly do you want me to do? Do you know what I mean? Like this, this isn't, and, and, and he doesn't buffer it. He doesn't kind of soften it. Or he doesn't explain. So what we're going to do is we want to establish, you know, a new covenant, which we'll call the Eucharist. The Greeks are going to put this term on it, you know, the Eucharist, which will be a sacrament of thanksgiving in which I will veil my divinity behind the species of bread and wine, which are my body and blood. That would have been lovely, a really appropriate moment for him to clarify all of that. Would have been right about now, you know. But he doesn't. He doesn't. He just leaves it wide open. And not surprisingly, as we'll hear tomorrow, after hearing this doctrine, many of his followers said, this is intolerable language. I'm out of here. I, that's, I mean, until this moment, things were fairly okay. But this is, the, the man has clearly lost his mind. Because uh, this, just, this just makes no sense at all. But what's very interesting about this gospel, amongst many other things, and we'll be look at just maybe two points, uh, is that if we are to say, or if we were to propose that Jesus is just a good guy, you know, a nice philosopher, someone who proposed a new way of living, someone who brought together some uh, people that he chose in order to teach them how to be good people and then sends them out with this message of how to be good people and how to be nice, right? That doesn't work. Do you know, like in, in, in the modern world, there's a tendency to uh, reduce the Lord's divinity down to a buonismo, they say in Italian. So it's like a kind of a, a do-gooder, do-gooder, that's it. So he, he, he likes to do good things and help people and be nice and, you know, find the lost sheep and, uh, you know, heal, heal people and, and, and tell them that, that we'll all go to heaven. And, and it seems to be a nice kind of a do-gooder message, but then you actually read the Gospels and you realize that's, that's not what he says at all, nor is that what he does. I mean, I don't want to misrepresent him, but he speaks about hell more than he speaks about heaven. I mean, he, he speaks about con serious consequences to our actions, <clears throat> but never says everyone gets to heaven. And then he comes along and drops a gospel like this, where he's telling us to eat his flesh and drink his blood, or we will not have life. This, these are not the words of a good philosopher or a guy who just proposes an alternative way of life, and then we'll all go skip our merry way to heaven. That is not what he says. So we have to be very careful like to... To look at what Jesus actually says and base our opinions of him based on that, on that, on the words that he has actually expressed and not on some kind of modern idea where we, we, we force uh, a contemporary idea of, 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 of this modern surfer Jesus, you know, peace, uh, this peace Jesus. If we force that on him when that's not what he said or did. So... It's a question we often ask uh, when we do school retreats. You know, is, is it enough to say that Jesus was a good guy? And usually when we ask the question, 
They say, yeah, I mean, yeah, I suppose it probably is. I mean, it, it, he definitely was good. So, yeah, maybe it's enough to say he was a good teacher. And then we put up some of these lines on the projector, you know? Well, if, would a good teacher, and if you're a good teacher, imagine Miss Kelly there. Miss Kelly, she's a lovely teacher. You're, you're, you're you know, your leaving cert or your, uh, whatever it is, sixth class teacher, Miss Kelly, grand. Imagine her coming into the class and saying, boys and girls, if you do not eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will not have life within you. But if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you'll live forever. Are these the words of a good teacher, boys and girls? And they go, no, these are not the words of a good teacher. These are the words of a psychopath. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like, you can't say those kind of words and say, you know, I'm a good teacher. I want people to eat my flesh and then we live forever. They're not the words of a good teacher. So either he is, as, 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 as C.S. Lewis would, would propose, either he's a liar, he's an absolute lunatic, or he's Lord. He's lying. He deliberately knows this is all made up rubbish. He's deliberately lying. Or he's a lunatic. Maybe he does believe it, but he's absolutely off his rocker. You know, eat my flesh, and it'll be great. And we live forever, lads. Wow. You know, absolutely loopers. Or, or he's actually Lord. So, like, we believe he's Lord, so then we, we put together the, the argument. How, why do we believe that? Because, again, we're not just believing blindly. All of the miracles that he works, as, as I've said a million times, now all the miracles Jesus works, he calls them signs, signs. Signs point to something else. So the miracles, he didn't just come to eradicate blindness or eradicate leprosy. He came that all those healings would point to something even greater than physical healing which is the hope of salvation that we have in him through his passion, death, and resurrection, because he is God, made man, who dies on a cross for us and therefore pays our death, debt, and therefore we can get to heaven. That's far greater than just healing, even if there were 1,000 or 2,000, 3,000 blind people in Jerusalem at the time. Greater miracle, the greater miracle is the healing of the heart. And I think we, hopefully, I think we see that more and more in our modern world. Like if we eradicate all sorts of physical ailments, important and all as, as that would be, it's much more important to heal the, the human heart because we have this strange phenomenon in our contemporary world of people being healthy in their bodies but not wanting to live. They have a healthy body but they'd rather be dead. You know, they have no hope, no joy, uh, absolutely and completely discouraged but there's nothing wrong with their bodies. Yeah, because we're more than a body. Whereas if the person's heart is healed, then if there is grief in their family, if there is a diagnosis of leukemia or something, we can carry those things, even with serenity. Don't get me wrong, we still should do all we can to alleviate people's suffering and pain and come up with cures for these things. Absolutely. Absolutely. But there is something greater than physical healing. Because I remember I read an article once on, on uh, the miracles Jesus worked and some atheists went through scripture, went through the gospels and counted all the miracles that Jesus worked. And basically... His conclusion was Jesus didn't do a whole pile. I mean, he, you know, he healed uh, maybe something around 20-ish lepers and cured five blind people and raised two people from the dead. At the end of the day, modern medicine does that in any one city a hundred times over, you know, the, the number of healings from various diseases. So what did Jesus really do? But like, his point wasn't to come and eradicate uh, illness. His point was actually... Deeper, much, much, and I would definitely firmly argue, much, much more important. Because there's no point having a healthy body and with that healthy body dancing our merry way somewhere else. You know, it's better to have an ailment which reminds me that I need God and causes me to come back to Him in prayer and, and in trust and, and realize that I'm not God and also be, be reminded of my mortality. I'm not. Here forever. Use your time well. Because time ill spent is lost forever. Time ill spent. You don't get it back. So use your time well. And little reminders of our mortality can be very, very helpful in that. Especially, you know, when you hit your, your 70s, your 80s. I mean, you realize friends start to pass away. And maybe spouses and that. And you realize, well, we're not actually here forever. Where am I headed? What's it all about? And then a gospel like this starts to make a whole lot more sense when we keep in mind the big picture of our, our, our calling to heaven, 
to be one with him. So I remember I was, uh, I was, so, I was uh, a priest at the time and we had our community retreat. So I was in Slovakia and there were, I suppose, maybe 50 of us priests and 180 sisters. And our retreat takes place in a hall, which is a, basket, it's a basketball court, and then we put a stage up in a basketball court, so the, the sanctuary area is up, um, up fairly high, actually, uh, so everyone can see. Great. So as I distributed Holy Communion, and as I was coming back, I had my, my ciborium, and because the, the, the stage is built on a basketball court, the stage bounces a bit, you know? So, so if, if I bounce here, the plastic handle would shake kind of thing, you know what I mean? Uh, so, so as I'm walking along, um, we get used to walking with flowing robes as a priest, but like you'd be fairly paranoid of the presence of any low-lying candles, right? Because these things are flammable. <laughs> okay, so I'm coming back from Holy Communion, and I'm carrying the ciborium, and I'm trying, and then our, our sisters are wonderful, but they do love lots of flowers. So you're trying not to knock over flowers, because there are vases everywhere. Again, all, like, you know, I can't, you, you know, you, have, you can't check everything. So you're trying to, you've got flowing robes that, you know, Lots of blind spots, lots of blind spots. So you're trying not to hit flowers. You're trying not to go up in a blaze of glory. <laughs> trying not to set yourself on fire. Trying not to knock anything. And then you get to the tabernacle, which is surrounded by candles and flowers. Right? So you have to navigate your way. And so I, I, I didn't realize this. But as I was walking, uh, I, I kind of carried the ciborium down low here. So I could see where I was going. Just see that I didn't knock anything, knock anything over. And Father Paul, uh, the founder of our community, in a very nice way, but I'll never forget it, in a very nice way, he just said at the end of Mass, and so we priests always have to remember that when we carry a ciborium, we never carry it down here. You're carrying the Lord of Lords. You carry him up here. And I knew that was aimed at me. And he was right. He was right. But like, ever since then, I always carry the ciborium up here. Always. And he's like, he's dead right, because... We, if we don't get this right, if priests don't get this right, how, how is anyone else supposed to know? We're, we're the minister, we're the, we're the ordinary ministers of, of the Eucharist. So the way we behave, the way we act or react, the way we celebrate Mass, the way we distribute Holy Communion, all of these things should underline what we've heard in our Gospel today. If you do not eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will not have life within you. He says it once. Anyone who does eat my flesh and drink my blood has eternal life, and I shall raise him up on the last day. Twice. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Three times. Okay, there's, there's no lack of clarity there. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me and I live in him. Four times. As I, <clears throat> who am sent by the living Father, myself draw life from the Father, so whoever eats me will draw life from me. Five. This is the bread come down from heaven. Not like the bread our ancestors ate, they are dead. But anyone who eats this bread will live forever. Six. There is no lack of clarity there. There's no like, way of, 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 of in, interpreting that as, as in some way metaphorical or symbolic. It, it, it's just back to back six times. The Eucharist is me. Eat this. Eat me if you want to live. Now, Again, they couldn't really have understood at the time. It, it, it wasn't there. They would understand it fairly quickly afterwards. But at the time he said this, they couldn't have understood. So I, I absolutely would have been one of the people to leave him at that point. I'm sorry, I, I, I can imagine I, I, mean, I wasn't there, but I can, I can absolutely imagine I would have been. If you hear someone talking about cannibalism, like, okay, I'm glad he worked miracles. Don't really know how he did it, but this isn't... This isn't the way, like, you can't do this. But not all left him. Not all. I mean, see tomorrow. We won't go into it now, but this is intolerable language. So people leave. And Jesus says, what about you? To his disciples. Will you go away too? And Peter answers, Lord, to whom shall we go? To whom shall we go? You have the message of eternal life. That's a huge statement of faith based on what Jesus just said, which is, again, very 
It's very blunt and there's no buffer, there's no softening, there's actually no even explanation. It's just dropped. What Peter says is quite amazing. Lord, who would we go to? I don't really understand this. But you have the message of eternal life, so we're staying here. We're staying with you. You know the old expression which moms often use, you are what you eat. If you keep eating chocolate, you'll turn into a big blob of Nutella. Whereas if you eat vegetables, that's so much better. You turn into a big broccoli. Wow. Um, so the point is like we should have a balanced diet, you know, all these various nourishing things uh, to strengthen our bodies. You are what you eat. If we consume the Lord, then we should become him. And if the Lord's blood flows in my veins and flows in your veins, and flows in his veins and her veins, then we really are one body. Because receiving the Lord doesn't just, it's not like putting fuel in a car. It's, it's much, much deeper. We're supposed to become like him. Become like him, not just be part of his club, but imitate him. Love like him. Forgive like him. React to opposition and hatred and suffering like him. Pray like him. So we ask the Lord today for a deeper love for the Eucharist. A deeper love for his abiding presence in this miraculous sacrament, in this unfathomable gift. And we ask that as we receive him, we will draw life from him. And that we can become what we receive.